Good evening, workshoppers. Thank you for joining us here tonight on episode 153 of the West March Workshop. Project Finris has been the, the talk of the town lately. There's a lot of interesting developments that we've had here in the last couple of weeks since our last episode, you know, which I, I do want to go through and start off by apologizing for that we missed last week. There were just some scheduling conflicts that kind of uh, happened and came up and we weren't able to go through and record. Uh, but we are here, one week delayed, I guess, which technically is getting us back on our original schedule. Um, you know, since we had uh, recorded a week early uh, for uh, Thanksgiving, and then now here we are back on what would have been the traditional week. So if you've been following along for years, we've not we've gotten back to our original cycle. Uh, but as you can go through and see here. Uh, Leviathan is not with me tonight, uh, and that is actually, unfortunately, one of our first uh, topics to discuss here on the show. Uh, due to just uh, a lot of stuff going on in uh, personal life and such, uh, Leviathan is actually having to step away from the uh, West March workshop uh, for a little bit, uh, just for personal reasons. And so that is something that uh, definitely uh, wish him the, uh, the best of luck in going through and getting all that stuff uh, situated. Uh, but I would I would ask everyone to go through and uh, give uh, give Leviathan some positive energy, you know, send him send him you know some of that energy so that way he can go through and get that uh, positive motivation spirit bomb going there. But uh, and uh, till then, you know, it's uh, just gonna be me. I'm gonna be going through and thinking about some things that I can do with the uh, the, the format of the show, um, you know, just kind of uh, in the uh, the interim. Uh, so that way we can get things uh, going. Maybe we make some uh, some changes on how we do things. We'll uh, be definitely looking in. We've always discussed wanting to go through and grab in some uh, special guests every once in a while. It might be something that I go and uh, get done, you know, moving forward. Our next episode is going to be uh, just like a a week before Christmas, so it probably won't be anything too major happening then, but as we go into the new year, we'll go and try try to see how things uh, things uh, pan out and things happen. It, the, since this is a great opportunity to do uh, show format changes, I would love to go through and hear your thoughts. Uh, if there's anything that you would like to see changed on the show, any segments that you want us to see us bring back, or things that you want us to go through and talk about, uh, by all means, now is the time. Uh, Westmarch Workshop at blizzpro.com is the email address if you want to go ahead and drop us uh, just some uh, some comments or uh, thoughts on where we'd like to take the direction of the show and such. Uh, but with uh, with that uh, out of the way, we of course have a, a great amount of Diablo news to go through and cover here uh, for tonight's episode. Uh, one of the first ones, of course, that's uh, been the big thing is the uh, PTR. We've got a uh, the 2.6.4 PTR has come and gone since our last episode, and it has a lot of changes that we weren't exactly expecting. Uh, there is uh, we've we're kind of given a hint at BlizzCon when Brandy was on Riker's stream saying that there'd be some changes coming in season 16, and oh, oh yeah, there were quite uh, quite a few changes indeed. Uh, there's a, a huge list of uh, set changes and things that you can go over uh, if you haven't seen them yet already. But almost every single set in the game got a buff. And the reasoning behind that uh, was they wanted to try and make the sets, um, uh, I guess, a bit more in line with one another. Because you do have some outliers that are going through and clearing you know, upwards of 120s, whereas other ones still are struggling around like 100. This this balance patch was definitely to give more parity between the builds. And uh, I know a lot of people, there were some knee-jerk reactions when you see some numbers that are going for like 5,000% damage to 15,000% damage, and I think Riker and a lot of other people in the community have already went through and made it pretty clear that it's not really that big of an increase. You're just you know, tripling the damage uh, of what the uh, the set is doing, which in essence really only gets you, you know, six or seven uh, greater rift levels, you know, and so it's something that's really done to bring the bottom performing specs up to what everyone else is. As you'll notice, oh, there's Riker. What's going on, sir? 
um, that, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot more with making everything get uh, tighter in, in terms of the, the uh, set performances than trying to really uh, topple the king builds. Uh, when it comes to like the the greater rift uh, greater rift uh, speed runs and such, you know, multi shot demon hunter might compete with uh, Rathmas and such. Uh, and you have you, depending upon the level that you're going for of the greater rift, you might see some you know demon hunter rift guardian killers and just some other things that could go through and shake things up. But like um, you know the thorns necro greater rift killer is probably still like the top thing that's going to be out there. Uh, as far as, you know, segmenting its place in the, the top four player clears. And because this is all damage changes, you're not really going to see any changes in the support classes there. So for the very top end meta builds, you might really only see a little bit of fluctuation, maybe, in the, the, the DPS is going through and clearing hordes. But it was a very, very short PTR. There was some testing that was done. Um, but it definitely is far from final, and I will be very interested in seeing where expectations are at the beginning of Season 16 versus what actually pans out at the end of Season 16. This is going to be a very interesting season if for uh, nothing else we'll be doing the testing live. Normally we've had like two months to go through and test uh, on a PTR, but this time around, very much less so. Uh, you know, there's a big difference between trying to figure out what's top within one week versus two months. Um, and of course, uh, speaking on the topic of Season 16, we did see earlier today, uh, actually just a little over an hour ago, uh, that the season itself has been delayed. Um, and uh, this post came in from Tivalier. Uh, stating, hey everyone, in order to ensure a smooth transition between seasons and give player, uh, players extra time to enjoy the double bounty cash buff, we'll be ending season 15 on January 6th. With this, season 16 is scheduled to begin on January 11th. As a quick heads up, we'll also be resetting the current era leaderboards on January 11th. So you've still got time to push for that final leaderboard placement before the rollover occurs. Good luck, Tivalier. And now this is something that, at least to me, makes a little bit more sense, especially given once we saw how big the, the, the changes were in patch 2.6.4. Uh, a lot of us were just expecting some like little, maybe some little minor tweaks in a, uh, a new um, kind of uh, a season, uh, season buff or, uh, you know, season, um, uh, season, uh, dang it, what is it? Can't think of the word right now, but yeah, season buff. Uh, and the the uh, just the set rebalancing kind of uh, caught at least caught me off guard, and it was something that a lot of us just weren't expecting. Uh, but uh, with this level of changes, I definitely am not surprised they wanted to go through and end the season. You know, like that week before, a lot of uh, Blizzard employees are taking Christmas holidays. Blizzard kind of shuts down like the last uh, two two weeks in December, and so them going and pushing this until the new year. Uh, just so that way, in case there's any um, last-minute changes, last-minute bugs, uh, exploits and such that they didn't account for, it will give them time to go through and uh, hop on and uh, address that very quickly. Um, and, you know, now that we're definitely on more of the topic of Season 16, uh, there is uh, a brand new mechanic that they are going to be changing out. No longer are we getting, like, the double goblins or double uh, bounty mats, Everyone is getting a Ring of Royal Grandeur, and this is also the, the first time in forever that seasonal play will be different from non-seasonal play. That even though we had the themed seasons with the double, double bounty bags, double goblins, even if you weren't playing on the season, if you are playing a non-seasonal character, you benefited from those changes too. Uh, this time around, you're only going to get that Ring of Royal Grandeur buff by playing a seasonal character. And there's some people that uh, have, uh, you know, complained about that because they their focus mainly just on, you know, going through and empowering their one character and not going and rolling a new one with the seasons. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, uh, they don't enjoy the leveling up aspect. They only want to play uh, their super powered character and getting as much as they can into that uh, into that person. 
So there are still some people out there that don't play Seasons, and they feel as if they're kind of missing out on something in this respect, but to me it's not really anything different. Even going back to Diablo 2, there are items as well as rune words that you can only create on ladder. Uh, and uh, even though you have like the trading economy and such that you can get uh, in the beginning when a lot of those items were, went through and introduced, uh, you know, like patch uh, 0.9 and patch 1.10, that, you know, you didn't get access to those rune words or those items for like a year uh, afterwards. And this is something that, you know, if you if you want to experience that gameplay of having that extra ring of royal grandeur for your character then you know just roll a seasonal character it's you know this is going to be something that's sort of divergent and different from the era leader, uh, leaderboards so it's not actually going to impact your uh, placement on those leaderboards it's just something fun and different to try out which is in, in essence what the seasons are it gives you an excuse to go and play a different character try something new uh, or if you're like me and a lot of other players, that you have a little bit more of that thrill of going and starting a brand new character, that uh, thrill of the, the gear hunt, and that uh, your actual enjoyment of the game begins to drop once everything is perfect and everything's in place, and you're just looking for that 5% stat increase. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the multiple sides that are going through and coming from it. But, you know, also because of the very limited play window uh, that we had with the PTR and the addition of also having to create um, uh, new characters and such. But, uh, you know, we have no idea really how that's going to impact the, the leaderboards uh, when or not just leaderboards, but the, the builds and items and everything is just far from finalized. So it's going to be really cool uh, just to see what these in-game builds look like, you know, and how much just that one item, that Ring of Royal Grandeur, will actually have on, are we, are we going to get, you know, an extra couple of, uh, you know, greater rifts uh, on those solo clears, or if you're going to get more people that are going through and hitting that cap of 150. I am kind of interested that they didn't raise the cap beyond GR 150. I guess they feel as if the it's still a rather elite club of players that have managed to go through and kind of hit the end game. Uh, but uh, it might be something that they go and uh, uh, add in, because we, we do now at least have this confirmation that uh, Classic Games is wanting to go through and do more and continue to have some form of update schedule for Diablo 3. We don't know what it is, um, you know, it, is it going to be a yearly patch? Is it going to be, you know, uh, every couple seasons or just as they deem it necessary? We're, we're, we're not really sure what, what classic games or what Blizzard has planned for the, the continued future um, of Diablo 3. But if we find out anything, we'll definitely go and let you know. Uh, which, you know, of course ties into a lot with, as we'll be talking about uh, in a little bit, the, the Kotaku article for the, the future of Diablo. Um, and also just while we're on the topic of Seasons and Diablo 2 and Ladders and all the other types of fun stuff, uh, we do have, let me find it here, uh, this Friday, December 7th, is actually going to be Season 23 of Diablo 2. So if you're looking for something different, uh, you know, go ahead and jump on with the, the new Diablo ladder. I'm actually not sure... When they changed, you know, the D2 from ladders to seasons as well, I guess that happened sometime in the last couple of years. It's been a while since I last played Diablo, uh, or Diablo 2, I should specify. I think the last time that I played Diablo 2 was actually when we had a special um, off-episode stream where Leviathan and I had a whole bunch of players, uh, or a whole bunch of listeners hop on to a new Diablo 2 ladder on like a Saturday or something and play through on hardcore. Um, and it was it was an interesting experience because people would die and then they'd have to go and try and catch up and then they would like die while catching up and it just was, people kept dropping and I think we had maybe only a handful, maybe even only half the party, like four players still alive like the end of the stream. Some other people had went through and jumped back on but, um, uh, yeah, this, this time around, 
I am going through and jumping on um, this new ladder season, uh, but I'm doing it softcore. Just my my playtime has prevented me from doing um, hardcore. Just because a single a single death at the wrong time will pretty much spell the end of the season for me. But it is uh, it's gonna be weird. It's gonna be odd. It's been years since I last played D2, and just going back and looking at some of the old builds, as well as the uh, like the play strategies of going through and ooh, I can't. Excuse me, I, I can't wait for, you know, Tristram runs and things of that nature to go and, uh, you know, level up and go and kill Pendleskin. Fun stuff. All those memories. It, it's going to be a trip. I do plan on taking some notes so that way I can kind of uh, better compare uh, what it's like on a, a, a Diablo 2 ladder reset as opposed to a season reset. And just kind of like they're such a... a very different games uh, in terms of how you go and play. I feel as if Diablo 2 starts off at a, a at a higher bar in terms of difficulty, uh, but then once you kind of reach hell, it then plateaus. Your power continues to increase, but then the difficulty never does. And so it's almost like you don't have the greater rift system. And eventually, Torment 13, you know, gets super easy. And so we don't have, like, bugged mobs like the you know, the Serpent Magi in the Halls of Vought, or, you know, Gloams, God, evil things, uh, that actually go and make things you know, super, just, like, not difficult, just dumb, in, in terms of, like, the, the glitchy uh, difficulty levels that those things have. Um, and then looking over the show notes, I almost forgot before I get too far on the Diablo 2 tangent, uh, there are just a, a couple of things I did need to mention about Season 16, uh, for those that uh, might not be keeping up on where things fall within like the the seasonal uh, ladder or the the seasonal spectrum seasonal rotation that's a much better word um, with uh, season 16 uh, we're gonna have the following sets are gonna be available for Hadric's gift so if you're planning on going through and starting up with season 16 uh, if you are gonna be playing a barbarian you'll be getting the immortal King's call Crusader is seeker of light Demon Hunter is Natalia's. Monk is Yuliana's. Necromancer is uh, Tragol's. Uh, Witch Doctor is the Spirit of Eric here. And Wizards is uh, Veer's will be the, the sets. So that's something that, you know, even if you play a Demon Hunter, if you're not a fan of Nats, then you, maybe you'll start as something else, like, say, a Seeker of Light Crusader, just to go and get you started to farm up something different. Um, and then also... For your actual, um, you know, seasonal journey progression, uh, this this year or this season's conquests are Speed Demon, which is clear torment ten rift within two minutes, uh, level three gems to sixty five, uh, kill three hundred fifty mobs during a cursed event, uh, kill all bosses within twenty minutes, and uh, finish a level fifty five rift with at least six different set bonuses equipped. So this one actually is going to be relatively easy. The Speed Demon, um, which is the greater, which is the Torment uh, 10 Rift, the level three gems to 65, and the kill 350 mobs during a curse event, um, are all relatively simple. If uh, so, this is one of those ones where if you actually want to go for Guardian, it's going to be relatively, relatively easy. The the conquests are normally that thing that holds a lot of players back. In addition to um, the, the set dungeon. Well, I think that the set dungeons, of course, have been ridiculously easy since it was changed many seasons ago. Uh, and then as far as your rewards go, um, this, uh, this season is going to have kind of like a map of sanctuary portrait frame. Uh, and then you'll also have a kind of, uh, monarch butterfly wings, uh, for your, your two seasonal rewards as far as cosmetics go. That'll be uh, interesting to go through and take a look at. I, I'm, I'm going to be interested. In, you know, I'm thankful that this is one of those ones where it's a relatively easy uh, path to Guardian. Just because it's like it's a map of Sanctuary. So it's kind of like it's like a lore thing. And so I feel as if I should have that, you know, at its uh, at its highest uh, at its highest form, like the little lava portrait. So we'll uh, we'll go through and check that out. As Dread is going and pointing out in chat, this is actually the last known pre-made portrait and now i haven't really seen too many people that have dug in and have done um 
you know, the uh, the whole data mining within the patch itself uh, from the PTR to go and see if there's anything new that was added. Uh, but that'll be interesting to go and see. Are they going to start recycling season rewards going into season 17? Or, you know, are we at least guaranteed a minor patch if for nothing else uh, for the next season just to give us new seasonal rewards and whatever they might expect. A lot of people were thinking for season 16 that we would see a, um, a Legacy of Nightmares uh, buff uh, style season uh, mechanic. Uh, just because it was something that some developers had talked about, you know, while at BlizzCon. And where Legacy of Nightmare did get a buff, uh, so it's up going up from 100% uh, damage per ancient item to 500% damage per ancient item. Still not enough to really compete with most sets uh, for a lot of classes. It'll be interesting that, you know, where that kind of stands, maybe as a Torment 13 speed run, or just something that you want to do for some mid-level greater rifts just to change things up. Uh, it'll be it'll be uh, cool to go through and try out. Uh, to, who knows? Maybe we'll get Season 17 will be only Legacy of Nightmares drops, and that's your only set that you get. <laughs> or I'm still rooting for the nothing but Blackthorn season and seeing if people can go through and like push Greater Rift 90. Um... Going on, uh, before we jump into the Kotaku article, the uh, the last thing that we have to talk about is we did finally get our um, response from Blizzard. You know, a couple weeks ago we had read uh, that uh, Blizzard was, you know, hearing from you, formulating feedback to go and give a, a response, uh, you know, to the community itself. And uh, this is uh, what Nevelistus and the Diablo teams went and had to say. We continue to read feedback and our internal discussions are ongoing. We have many plans for Diablo across multiple projects which we'll be revealing over the course of the coming year. We are eager to share more about all of our projects but some will have to wait as we prefer to show you rather than tell you about them. It's going to take some time as we strive to meet uh, your expectations but now more than ever we are committed to delivering Diablo experiences the community can be proud of. Signed, the Diablo teams. So what this sounds like to me is that it was actually uh, kind of like a joint response, you know, in between the, the multiple teams out there working on the multiple projects, uh, which is that, that line itself has kind of become a, uh, a sticking point for a lot of the community. Uh, but it is one of those, the interesting thing that we can glean for that is that they will be showing some of these other projects this next year. Um, they're not going to show all of them, so if your expectation is still, you know, Diablo 4 or bust, I still don't think that we're really going to get much of anything on Diablo 4 next year, um, potentially. I'm still holding that one back. Things might change, you know, especially with the, uh, the blowback from how the announcement of Diablo Immortal itself was, uh, handled, uh, and... The, this kind of a bombshell of a Kotaku article that went through and really delved into what has happened with the Diablo franchise since Reapers of Souls uh, dropped, and even before that, since like uh, Diablo 3 dropped. And we might as well just kind of like go through and you know get into it. And the, this this article was uh, posted on uh, Kotaku. This was actually now a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were. Uh, you know, going to uh, discuss this on uh, last episode, but then things happened, and then now it's, you know, this episode, unfortunately, because of uh, Leviathan having to take a step back, it's just me and my thoughts. Uh, it's something that we could definitely, if we get some other people, you know, uh, on the show between here and whenever, it, we can talk about their thoughts and where Diablo is heading and so on and so forth. But it is, uh, it is big. It is something that I'm not going to be able to go through and talk about every single thing in the entire article on this uh, show. But if you're listening to this, you know, you're a Diablo fan. And if you're a Diablo fan, you need to read this. It's the past, present, and future of Diablo. It's on, uh, it's posted on Kotaku uh, back on November 21st. 
And it's actually, you know, where I got the title of this episode, Project Fenris, as we came to go and learn uh, throughout that article, is what the supposed um, kind of in-progress title of Diablo 4 is currently. Um, but this actually kind of goes back and is a lot of things that we've talked about on the episode, on the, the show over the years, that even before Diablo uh, Reaper of Souls shipped, they were working on a second expansion. And that's something that we've seen, uh, you know, kind of around the time that Kanai's Cube came out. There were um, uh, graphics and monsters and other uh, tags in the game code that were labeled X2, which mimics a lot of the things for Westmarch and the Crusader that were labeled X1 for Reaper, showing that at some point there was a second expansion that was being made. Did it get canceled? You know, did they just decide to roll all of the um, expansion content uh, into Reaper uh, for free? And this kind of shed a little bit more light on it that there was some decisions that were made from higher up uh, within Blizzard that decided they wanted to shelve Diablo 3 uh, because of all of the um, bad publicity and kind of the, the divisiveness that it created within the community between you know, uh, controversies over the art style, the, you know, the, the gameplay, uh, in Error 37, the real money auction house, that they, they felt as if that the best way to salvage it and to continue kind of, uh, the Diablo franchise was to make the, the next iteration. And this happened before Reaper of Souls launch and caught the development team off guard. That they they were proud of all of the work that they had done on Reaper. And you know, for those of you at home listening to this, you know, and you understand why Reaper turned the game around 180. Like you know, uh, I enjoyed the game before Reaper of Souls, but Reaper of Souls made it something completely different. You know, this this took it back a lot to its roots. It made the story itself darker, the music more immersive, uh, just the other, like, gameplay mechanics that they added in from, like, the Greater Rifts, Legendary Gems, and, you know, the, the Bounties, Adventure Mode itself. It really breathed new light, or new life, into the game itself. And this is something that I would have loved to have seen what the second expansion looked like. Especially when you go through and see what they were able to do with the Necromancer. Uh, you know, those uh, new things that they learned from, you know, the, the Crusader and the, the, their new take on, you know, class and set designs. That there's, there's a lot that they could have done, you know, with the game in another expansion and what that might have looked like. But uh, the higher-ups were like, nope, D4 bust. And... What it seems like is that the actual, the next iteration that they were kind of uh, working on or dabbling with, which was codenamed Project Hades, uh, was actually going to be an over-the-shoulder Dark Souls-esque game, you know, set within the Diablo IP. And this is something, you know, again, we've talked about for, like, when those first uh, unannounced project job postings went through and came where some of the the postings were looking for uh specifically kind of like over the shoulder um i think it was dang it now i'm uh pressing my memory here they were looking for i believe it was either visual effects or cinematic um or just um uh model riggers with experience uh of over the shoulder um, modeling in just uh, 3D, uh, 3D um, design aspects, and that is like that. That was the Dark Souls project, you know, uh, that they were going through and looking for things like that. But uh, as we came to learn through the course of the article, that project ended up kind of like hitting a brick wall and was scrapped completely. And you know, from there, then also we saw that you know uh, Josh had you know left the company and went and joined. Uh, bonfire studios and then around that time uh you know the diablo 3 team which had been getting smaller and smaller and smaller as they had been you know you had like uh individuals like don vu and john yang that got uh, moved over to the wow team uh the project hades had taken some of the other um you know diablo 3 devs and there wasn't a lot of people that were left to work on d3 for uh you know 
some stuff like you know Kanai's Cube and other the patches and updates. Uh, once Project Hades was scrapped, Team Three saw that as well. We can go and show you know the higher ups what we can do, and that became the Necromancer. That became you know the Shrouded Moors. You know the, the and that was a, the, kind of like one of those like the last big hurrah for Diablo Three. What we can go and see that even though. And some of the, the earnings from last year have showed that they um, that the, the Necromancer pack actually did have a positive impact on some of those earnings because in one of the, I think it was like the quarter four for the 2016 earning report so like the quarter one of 2017 um, uh, had stated or no sorry it was 2000 the quarter four of 2017 I think it was. That stated that they had higher than expected earnings because of the Necromancer pack, and you know that you know showed that at least that's the one little bit of evidence that we had that the Necromancer in and of itself was successful. But it seems it still was just too much pressure from higher up that they they wanted uh, D3 done, and that uh, you know it seems that it now more or less is confirmed. You know without anyone actually officially going through and raising up a little. A banner saying that D3 is on classic games, D3 is on classic games. Uh, and so it does at least give us the opportunity of having some updates like what they did with Season 16 or the Switch port and such. These are projects so the classic games feels that they're capable of going and tackling, uh, but we don't know what the future looks like for D3. Whereas, you know, Team 3 itself is still focused on Diablo next, Diablo 4, and whatever version that might take, with the, the current project being uh, Project Hades. And from some of the things that we went through and heard, that uh, it's actually, there's the uh, Design Director, um, which is a different title from Game Director that Team 3 has had in the past, but different, uh, different games have different titles you know lead designer game director design director you know uh and so it might not be um kind of like um standardized nomenclature for the title of whoever is running the project uh and so the new title might be just uh design director and not game director but it's uh uh lewis uh Bariga and his kind of thought process for Project Fenris was taking it back to the the roots of Diablo. Going through and embracing the darkness is like one of the specific uh, kind of like pitches that they had made um, uh, in that supposedly they had made for Project Fenris, um, and that they have a, a very very strong vision about what this game should be. And that there's a lot of people within uh, Blizzard that are excited for what this uh, is going to be. And it's actually, you know, it's one of, one of the design pillars for the game is Embrace the Darkness. And that, you know, has had some people talking, you know, within the community since this, uh, you know, article came out. There's some people that are saying, oh, this is just kind of like a, a, a PR piece, you know, that it's like fake leaks and such. Um, I, I feel as if this was an actual kind of like a, a PR, a kind of like a, just like a, a PR piece to go through and appease the fans. We would have gotten more of a response from Blizzard than just the recommitment to the multiple projects on multiple teams. That we, we would actually, that they would have at least, you know, dir in direct nomenclature, direct words say, we're working on a PC title, you know. Um, that if this was actually something that Blizzard had planned to go through and release with Kotaku, uh, that it definitely, I, I feel as if this is, this is genuine. This is developers going through and leaking this because, you know, uh, the cancellation of the D3, uh, expansion and then the shift change, like a Dark Souls type game had a lot of developers shocked. Like it saw, it was like, this came out of nowhere. And that this is something that, you know, well, they're, they're fans of the franchise. If you talk to any of the developers at BlizzCon or what have you, they, they love Diablo. Not just like Diablo 3, but they love the IP and they want to make sure that they're giving a good experience. And that they're, you know, staying true to 
what it means to be a Diablo game. And them going back and saying, well, let's kind of change gears a little bit and try and refocus in, instead of saying making like the next generation ARPG, you know, if one of those design pillars is, you know, like embracing the darkness, refocusing on what makes a Diablo game Diablo, you know, that I think most fans would be okay with if it doesn't like try to completely uh, push the envelope um, and you know as long as they deliver on what it means to be a true Diablo title and that's why a lot of people have problems with say Immortal is because they don't believe that a mobile game can deliver a Diablo experience um, and of course there's the you know myself included just the kind of skepticism because mobile just has you know the the connotations of being uh cash cow but that that's a discussion for another day and one that of course we've we've had uh many times before but it does go through and reiterate the the article does go through and reiterate some things that we've talked about um on the show and something that i talked about briefly in one of my articles um from before blizzcon on diablo fans that i feel as if the post overwatch blizzard is just scared to announce something too early and that it generally is kind of like the the shadow of titan uh as well as like starcraft ghost hangs on their heads you know just like the cancellation of titan was something that even forced um Metzen that it put him in such like a dark place because they had so much hope and expectation built into this project and it was going through and it had been leaked and even though they uh, blizzard officially never really acknowledged it or said anything about what it was going to be that there was this expectation of well this is going to be this is going to surpass wow this is like their next generation mmo and oh did you hear this rumor that you're going to be able to like say like be a shopkeeper during the day and a superhero at night and they're going to push everything to the next level and then it it didn't work out and they had to cancel the project and that cancellation was so soul crushing for Metzen you know it was one of the, the reasons that he had decided to step away from the company um, that I feel as if some of those things are just they are scared to kind of they're not scared to go out and take chances and do things differently and try uh, like big experimentations they're they're scared of letting those things out of Pandora's box. They they don't want to set expectations, um, you know, out there within the community that they're working on these projects. And that's something uh, I'm trying to remember which article it was, but a while ago they had mentioned that they're only at like kind of like a a fifty percent launch rate over the history of the company um with the titles that they create and the titles they actually ship there's so much going on behind the scenes of things that they're coming up with and just well it didn't work out this doesn't meet our expectations you know and so they just you know scrap the project and move on there there are you know some aspects that maybe it's kind of like a shareholder thing um but you know there's Within any business, there's R&D. There's things that you have as far as like risk analysis of things that you're going to generate money or put money into that are just not going to be worth it to release. It's not going to, you know, and I think that's at least one thing that still kind of shows that Blizzard um, is still Blizzard. Uh, because if, if Activision had more of kind of like a, a stranglehold and is getting more of their roots into Blizzard you're you're gonna see starcraft ghost get released because that was one of those things that of course you know uh, a highly anticipated game that just didn't play well didn't meet their expectations blizzard just was like this is not going to live up to the standards that we've set forth for being a blizzard game and despite everything that's out there for it we're not releasing it it's just it's done it's over goodbye uh in an Activision world, it doesn't matter that game would get released. And that would be one of those things to me to like go through and continue to keep an eye on. And I think, you know, Immortal might be one of those first titles to actually go and take that, especially because this is, you know, a, a joint venture with a, another developer. 
we can go and look at just what is immortal play like what is the the pay to win uh, mechanics within it how is the actual gameplay uh, gonna be within and if it's you know just a kind of a a, a phoned in presentation with a diablo name stuck to it then yeah that might give a little bit more credence to uh, activision calling some more of the shots if it actually does deliver on that diablo experience in a mobile format um and it is in, an acceptable level of microtransactions within the game uh whatever that might be I, I i don't even know how to answer that question or what my own expectations for the game uh in terms of monetization will be so it's kind of interesting talking about that i don't i can't i can't answer what i think would be acceptable and yet i'm putting it out there as you know like this this is a bullet point of expectations from the company uh but yeah we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what uh what all is going on there because i it's another big part of the article is just uh, a lot of people and some developers are fearful of the culture change at Blizzard with Activision taking on a more and more active role within the development of the company from, you know, cutting costs to, uh, you know, uh, having Activision, uh, former Activision employees like on boards and like, you know, uh, you know, chief financial officer and these other high level executive positions that people are scared that you know blizzard might not be blizzard and it's not just you know fans and communities if you any post on reddit right now is going through it's like well we, they don't deserve to be called blizzard anymore we have to call them activision um which i don't think is exactly fair but i'm a blizzard fanboy and a paid actor so take that for what it is um but it is it is definitely a, you know Telling when in the article some of the uh, Blizzard employees, some of the Blizzard developers are wondering the same thing. Like they're, you know, they haven't seen that shift yet, but changes like this are, you know, they're subtle. They take time. And so you might not be able to, you know, kind of uh, put a pin in the timeline and say, this is when everything changed. And it's a gradual process that some people are hesitant to see over time um yeah it it is one of those ones where it's like the the part about activision taking over is kind of uh you know gives you know uh, a pause to be cautious when looking at what the titles might be you know going forward in the future but they're kind of the the points that talks about fenris and it's still apparently very early in development and that they did want to show fenris at blizzcon 2018 it was something that had been in talks like back in january but they had never gotten it to the point where it was showable uh let alone playable and that has just been like we were talking in the pre-show like the the blizzard mo is you know when we go and we show a title we want it to be playable i believe wow classic is like the only thing in recent memory that was not playable uh when they announced it I think the, the next title uh, before that was uh, uh, Diablo 3 or StarCraft 2, whichever one of the ones was, you know, announced first uh, or announced second. Uh, and so that's just one of those ones where it's like, is uh, it, it is, I kind of like, I, I think the community would be accepting if you just said you were working on it, especially... <laughs> in this in this post immortal world uh but uh blizzard does things as blizzard does things and they they don't really seem to be wanting to change at all uh and how they how they do things they, they just talked about uh, i was really hopeful that when this article went through and came to light shortly after the um the the post you know from nevelistus saying that you know we hear you and we're collecting feedback and we're formulating a response that this might push blizzard's hand um and saying and making them acknowledge maybe a little bit more now that that information's out there uh but it seems like not even that is enough to kind of like get blizzard to kind of acknowledge um you know that they're they're working on like a, a pc title or something else at least we will get to hear more about some of these things. 
But what's uh, also interesting that they don't talk about within the article is what else is being developed besides Project Fenris or Immortal. The only other thing that it mentioned was Hades, but that was scrapped um, and is no longer actively being um, uh, developed. You know, what are what are these other projects? Because they're actual projects that are kind of like being developed from within Blizzard, I don't think that that's going to count like the, the rumored Netflix um, series or the, the comic that got delayed. Uh, so, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see. Especially given that the fact that they did say that they'll be showing off at least uh, multiple of the multiple projects. It'll be... Um, that'll be cool. And I really hope that we don't have to wait all the way until BlizzCon to see what some of these projects look like. Uh, maybe we'll have uh, some more, you know, if they do count, you know, something like the uh, the, the comic or Netflix or some of these projects that they are developing within BlizzCon. That'll probably be like a, a PAX or a San Diego Comic-Con announcement, things like that. Um, but uh, I, I at least want to hold out hope that the multiple projects does mean multiple games. You know, with uh, Diablo 4 and Immortal being at least a couple of them. Uh, who knows? Maybe future content for Diablo 3 might be something else. Um, well, we'll have to wait and see. One of, one of those other multiple projects could have been the Book of Atria, which I believe just released yesterday. Uh, hopefully you've gotten your copy. Uh, and if you want to check out, you know, if you're on the fence about it, you can always go through and check out my review over on Diablo fans. I give it a 5 out of 5 Nephilim. It is, uh, it is definitely awesome. Riker going through and saying Diablo PvP game. Uh, yeah, well, just remember, PvP for Diablo 3 is confirmed. Jay Wilson said it, that PvP is coming in patch 1.10. And no one has ever gone through and retracted that statement, so Blizzard, I'm still holding you to it. PvP in patch 1.10. It's happening. It's coming. It's still there. Just wait for it. Riker, if you if you uh, you probably weren't aware, that is a ongoing joke on the show. PvP patch 1.10. I actually got Wyatt with that one at uh, BlizzCon, and uh, you know it's like I can't wait for you guys to go through and announce PvP in patch 1.10, and he just was kind of like, what? Like it was, um, it was kind of funny. I thought it was funny. I laugh at my own jokes. Um, but yeah. That's uh, one of those one of those big things that we at least know. You know, Diablo Four has already had at least on its second iteration, uh, and that they are at least kind of like scrapping that third person perspective. They're going back to the ice uh, the isometric form, which is interesting. Would it would a Diablo game still be a Diablo game if it wasn't isometric? Could it go to a different camera angle and still be Diablo? You know, it is. Um, you know, where did any of you ever play uh, Hellgate London? You know, that one had uh, a lot of difficulties. It had some of its own issues. I know I think that one's coming back to the Steam store for... Uh, uh, and that It's a very different game from when it originally launched. It's actually been like an active development for many, many years after the project was canceled, but it was entirely a, a Korean game. They didn't, they had like one, they ported over some of the content to NA, what, six years ago? Like shortly before or shortly after Diablo 2 came out. And uh, that would, that'd be interesting to maybe go through and take a look at. Um, but yeah, it's a... Uh, it's kind of cool seeing the article hit on all those things that we had talked about for many years. The the canceled expansion, the over-the-shoulder perspective. Uh, we, 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 we used to talk about the Diablo mobile game being just a meme or a joke, and then it actually ended up ended up becoming true. Well, that think about how many posts you've seen like over the last couple of years about people going and talking about a Diablo Dark Souls-style game. Or if they would play it, or what do you think that it would take its shape or form of? It's like I have to stop and think. Did they know? Were the, were these were these you know um, devs hiding behind secrecy that were going and kind of throwing it out there to gauge response from the community? Who knows? Who knows? 
I definitely have to pay more attention to the meme responses because it seems that some of those things ended up being true. Um, you know, and then we have the, the current uh, Project Fenris, which we at least have confirmed that's been in development since, uh, I believe the article said 2016, that uh, the Project Hades was canceled, um, you know, basically a couple months before they had announced the Necromancer, because uh, Hades had been canceled, and they pitched the idea and immediately started on the Necromancer. Um, and then they had done development of the Necromancer while a smaller team had started working on what uh, Diablo 4 would take its shape as with Project Fenris. And I imagine after the Necromancer um, content was done and finished, uh, they then kind of split the rest of the team from there, some going to Immortal. I imagine maybe some going to some of these unannounced projects, maybe some going to um, Alad Adham's uh, incubation team and you know uh, obviously some going you know to help with the uh, immortal project and Fenris so it's uh it's interesting it's interesting I would uh, I would love to see uh, the next iteration of Diablo 4 take a lot of the things that they've been talking about from Diablo Immortal um, we said it before on the show, and I know almost every single like uh, community member that you've ever seen. I know Riker is one that uh, I think you when I when I popped in and was watching your stream a little bit earlier, you had actually mentioned it um, that you see all of these features in Diablo Immortal, and it's everything that you've ever wanted in Diablo Three. And it's just like God. Well, at least maybe there's hope that they'll put it in Diablo Four. At least maybe, maybe. Well, we'll see. Uh, but with that, uh, pretty much just going to go and uh, close out the episode for us for tonight. Um, I do have a little bit of a community section to go and read through. Um, so we'll go and uh, jump into that one here. Virtually, I have no way to go and segue um, with, uh, with me here. We'll have to work on that. I'll get a recording of Leviathan just saying segue so that way I can go and play that. Um, so th this first one here, this one comes in from Aaron. Uh, this is, I had an idea for season 16 that may take the whole solo self-found challenge thing to a new level. Basically, it's playing D3 like D2 for a season with a playoff at the end. The season must be played entirely in story mode, no adventure mode whatsoever until the playoffs start. You can have separate brackets for hardcore and softcore competitors. You cannot equip any set items except the Legacy of Nightmares. Uh, blues, yellows, and legendaries only. Big honor system on this one, but I think it's crucial to the theme. Bonus points for not even using Legacy of Nightmares? Uh, as this is part of Solo Cell Found, you obviously can't group and the other uh, SSF rules will apply. Uh, then... Uh, that will last until there's one month left in the season, and then there's a playoff that will ensue with the following changes. Adventure mode is now in play. No sets, uh, there's still no sets allowed, but greater rifts and normal lifts uh, are in play, as well as the bounties. Each competitor in each bracket will have the last month of the season to accumulate legendary gems, levels, and push as high up on the GR as they can with their tune, and player with the highest GR clear at the end of the season declare the winner. You know, obviously just for bragging rights and, you know, uh, what have you. Uh, let me know uh, what you guys think. I thought this would be a good way to show Blizzard the kind of seasonal theme variants that you could roll out. And if there would be enough people uh, that would make its way officially into D3 or the next PC release. I also kind of want to illustrate to all the D2 originalists uh, how getting what they wanted for D3 would actually look. That would be a very interesting thing because there's some stuff um, that... Uh, that you could do, or how the game changes if you take out adventure mode. Because in that aspect, there's no Kanai's Cube. One, you don't have the materials that you have to run bounties for, and two, you actually physically cannot get Kanai's Cube in story mode. You have to be in adventure mode to get it. So you're playing through two months with no access to the cube. No, not only do you, even if you didn't have like the Legacy of Nightmares, uh, restriction and you could do sets because you could still you know go up in the torment levels to have sets drop um, that you can't you can't reforge items you can't re-roll items 
Uh, you'd still be able to have the, the Mystic to enchant uh, the, the properties and such, but yeah. You're taking out a huge, huge aspect of the game. That's basically, well, uh, that's, you know, early, you know, early Reaper that uh, would be setting the, the game back to. It's kind of like a cross between the end of D, uh, D3 and early Reaper in terms of play style. That would be an interesting take. This is something I think uh, I remember... Um, this was an offline discussion, not on the show, but like uh, Dread and Leviathan having a discussion where we, we've always joked about having like a, a no set set, uh, no set season where none of the sets drop. And it would be interesting from a gameplay side, but then from the mentality of a player, you're taking away something. And so it's not actually adding in content. You're changing content by removing stuff. Whereas like with the, the change that we have with season 16 of giving you a free... A Ring of Royal Grandeur is kind of slightly changing gameplay um, by giving you something as opposed to taking it away. So, you know, take that take that for what it is. Uh, but it was a it was a kind of a discussion that I didn't really contribute anything to, but I did find interesting that it is uh, something that one of the very first things that we think about about adding something adding value to the game is physically taking something away from it. Uh, this uh, next email comes in from Johan. Uh, I saw an interesting thread on Reddit about if Blizzard can keep up with companies who are all about one franchise. Let's say GGG has full focus on Path of Exile and is pumping out way more content than Blizzard can. Could Blizzard make a new Diablo who will still stand out with new systems? I think GGG can adapt way more quickly and can respond to anything Blizzard will throw at us uh, when the new Diablo game is announced. I think that's also why there's so much secrecy about any new Diablo game. What's your opinion on the matter? Um, this is one of those ones where it's kind of like, uh, if you talk or listen to a lot of the things that some of the former uh, Blizzard North developers, particularly like David Brevik, have said about what was it like working at Blizzard North um, in the early days versus like the later days and later going on to like flagship studios or like Bill Roper went to cryptic and um, things like that and they say that there's a definite like workflow change that happens when you go from a small team to a bigger team um, that there's a small team you usually wear a lot of hats and so like you're the person that designs like the treasure chest as well as codes the interaction for the treasure chest and then codes the loot table for the treasure chest so it's it's something that you can work on much faster because you're doing all of those things as opposed to well i'm just creating the treasure chest then i send it someone else that's going to then code the interaction but then there's another developer that's working on loot tables and randomization and drops and all that other stuff and that it's kind of like Having the larger team, you compartmentalize that work that does create, uh, you know, kind of a delay because there is a workflow. And if you have iterations, it's going back and forth between multiple developers um, that you can respond quicker with a smaller team than you can with, say, a bigger team. And we all, of course, just know that Blizzard's pace is a, you know, what you would expect from something with the name of Blizzard. It's you know, glacially slow. Um, whereas, you know, I think Blizzard itself really wouldn't necessarily have trouble competing in that respect, depending upon the scope of the game. Um, you know, obviously I don't ever see the next Diablo title, you know, uh, kind of uh, getting anything close to what World of Warcraft's development team is in size. But Diablo, the Team 3 has always been one of the smaller teams next to like Hearthstone uh, at Blizzard. Uh, and so that's something that if they did increase it and get a bit uh, bigger and uh, more uh, kind of like expansive with the game and its systems, it could warrant having a bigger team, which might slow down the pace of content um, in that respect. I, I don't really think that there's so much fearful of competition from the other companies when, when you look at it in terms of a market share, it's difficult because like Blizzard doesn't really publish how many copies of Diablo 3 they have sold or the number of like concurrent users online and such. So it is difficult to gauge where it and Path of Exile line up. 
but if we have to guess, uh, you know, Diablo 3 at its peak was up here, you know, with the Path of Exile being left very far behind. That, that's just what we can see in terms of, like, sales figures and such. It's not saying, you know, where they are in terms of actual player retention now at this point. Um, I, I would probably say, you know, Path of Exile at least would be keeping pace um, with, uh, with uh, D3. And that's something that is, like, because of GGG's commitment to continuing to create content um, and deliver on that experience. And this is something Leviathan and I have talked about in the past, is could the next Diablo title look like that? Could they, say, drop the four, just say Diablo, or, you know, like what I've been saying uh, for a while, Diablo Next, um, and just have it a living, breathing game that they continue to update not not saying that it's going to be an MMO, but like World of Warcraft, that it is a game that they continue to add content for in expansions or DLC or patches or what have you, uh, you know, and that this is going to be the title for the next 10, 15 years or what have you, and that that is it, that they're not going to be working on a Diablo 5, that they don't intend for there to be a Diablo 5. Uh, because that is, that is like the, the big difference between you know, Blizzard and their top competitors in the ARPG market is, you know, you look at Path of Exile and Grim Dawn and such, and they're focused only on that one piece of content, whereas Blizzard isn't focused on Diablo 3, um, you know, which is their current entry that's out there. Uh, classic games will probably continue to do, like, you know, like the season themes and such, but Blizzard's focus is on Diablo 4 in Diablo Immortal in the multiple project and a Netflix series and other things. But there is at least, you know, a dedicated team there that's working on Diablo 4. Um, and that that is what Blizzard's focus is. And I guess that gives a bit of... Um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, a mis misconception between kind of like what what they're going to go through and compete in terms of like content and quality. Cause look at, I guess a better way of looking at it is look at the, like the path of exile leagues, like, uh, and the content that they've been doing, you know, over the last couple of years compared to the content that blizzard was putting out, you know, for D three and reaper of souls, you know, uh, the original D3 was getting content patches all the time. They realized that they had uh, made a lot of mistakes and that they were very quick in trying to go through and address them, uh, but some of those core mechanical things they couldn't change until they did the expansion, so they held off on some of that stuff to go through and put into Reaper. But then once Reaper itself launched, I mean, you're going through and you're getting you know, Greater Rifts, Legendary Gems, Kanai's Cube, that they're going and hitting out a lot of content, a lot of changes, and a lot of uh, interesting things that, you know, uh, that diversified uh, gameplay, at least at the time, until, you know, you're comparing Torment 6 to Greater Rift 110. Um, that, that is kind of the, the level of commitment in content and such that you can, you, that you want to compare with what, GGG is doing with Path of Exile now. That that is that is kind of like the the commitment in terms of uh, quality and content between the developers that you want to actually look at and say that well this is this is how they would actually kind of compete once D4 comes out. Um, and but for that even actually thinking about it now, that's not even that's not even completely true because by the time that they had come out with Reaper and they were doing that content for it, they had already been told that's it, cut Diablo three. There's no second expansion. You guys are working on Hades now. Um, so yeah, who knows? If anything, that just gives us maybe a little bit more optimism towards what they could do with uh, Diablo next. We'll uh, we'll see. We will we'll definitely see. And this next and final email, this one comes in from Lion Sword. You know, as he went through and said, every time he sends into an email into the show, we have to end up canceling an episode. Um, because he had sent this one in literally the Wednesday before we were supposed to record last week. Um, 
Interesting conversation in Leviathan's Discord this afternoon. One of the community members was musing about continuing to play Diablo 3 or not, citing the inability for some lesser known or self-created builds to compete with the top meta, solo, or group builds we see on the leaderboards. His specific example was playing a Rathma Necro, which he did not necessarily enjoy, at greater of 60 and progressing fine, but then switching to a Pestilence build of his own making and struggling at the same greater rift level. Uh, this wasn't a great feeling from him, which I understand. It's an interesting topic to me, specifically because I feel a similar way about Uliana's or in Sun Wuko for the monk. I prefer the playstyle of Uliana, and especially the aesthetics of Uliana. Exploding Palm is my favorite ability in any game that I've ever played. Uh, that feeling I get when there are probably 50 or 60 mobs on screen, I get one of them to die with Exploding Palm on them, and it spreads to everything, thanks to Gundo Gear. And it starts a, a slow and spectacular chain reaction of demonic demise. It is so fulfilling, so gratifying. But it's slower and weaker right now than some Wukos blow up the screen with fire build. So I play a Wuko because it's better. However, that doesn't necessarily stop me from playing Oleanas. I, uh, a few play season, a few play sessions uh, back, I put together Oleanas group, Exploding uh, Palm Monk, with Knight and Shepherd. It is admittedly completely useless on its own and provides no benefit against a Rift Guardian, but when paired with a legit single target damage uh, dealer, it can clear density like crazy. Is that better than just playing Wuko? From efficiency's standpoint, probably not, but it's still fun as hell. Diablo 3, uh, like really any other game in existence today, has a meta. Uh, builds that are just better than the others because people do math and find out what is best and then everybody does that. But if that doesn't line up with your favorite build, what do you do? Do you play your favorite build anyway, knowing that it's not as powerful and you aren't being the most efficient? Do you play the meta build because it's the most efficient, even if you may or may not enjoy that playstyle? How do you uh, balance playing what you enjoy most versus playing what is most efficient if they're not the same? I'll hang up and listen. And that is a very interesting point and something that I'm sure that I'm probably going to be talking a little about a little bit more following the new Diablo 2 ladder. And I think a lot of that comes down to the, the endless dungeon of the Greater Rift system is one of the problems with class and set balance within Diablo. A lot of people will say that it is the focus of set the, of our individual player power on items and sets more so than skills and the, the player selection. And that is definitely uh, a point in it. But in Diablo 2, like, you know, you can clear hell as a bear sword. It's, it's expensive as hell to go through and get double dream, but you can do it. You know, is it efficient? No. Are there better ways to doing it? No. Are you going to clear it that much slower than some other builds? Well, I guess if you're, you know, competing with, say, you know, an Enigma um, hammer, um, you know, Blessed Hammer Pally, maybe, yeah, in that respect. But it's something that you can do and you can have fun. Because Diablo 2, once you maxed Hell, wasn't very hard. It was something that you actually, the, the one of the enjoyments of Diablo 2 was, what is the stupidest build I can beat Bale with? You know, what is, what is the dumbest thing that I can actually clear through all of Hell um, with that build? And I think that that's one of those things that is just the design, um, uh, like kind of like the design goals in Diablo 3 changed that. And when they made an infinitely scaling difficulty system, uh, that reinforces a meta. Um, and that is definitely one of those ones, like, like, you're, like the, the question, how do you balance playing what you enjoy versus what is most efficient? That depends on, you know, what it is that you're trying to get out of the game. If you're looking to go and, you know, keep up with your friends that are going in speed running Greater if 90s, yeah, that's not going to leave you a lot of room to start playing uh, individual builds. And if you're, you know, uh, if your build that you went through and crafted and you have a lot of fun going and doing Torment 13 with, and then you struggle in Greater if 6, excuse me, Greater if 60 or, you know, Greater if, uh, you know, 70 or 80, then yeah, that's, that, that is going to be kind of problematic because it's, you know, something that you, you feel penalized for not playing one of these meta builds. And I mean, that's, 
it's kind of like, unfortunately, it is what it is. And that will be something that, you know, they may or may not address in the next iteration of Diablo. I, I wouldn't be broken up if we didn't get a greater rift system uh, in Diablo 4, just because I think that it has kind of like some negative aspects um, to a uh, gameplay by zeroing in and focusing on those meta builds. Uh, but at the same time, how do you continue to offer content after you, you beat the game on the hardest difficulty? It's, you know, kind of like a, a give or take. I think World of Warcraft's Mythic Plus system is kind of interesting. It's like taking the Greater Rifts and then uh, kind of condensing it back down to like the Torment levels. Uh, where the, the difficulty hops between like the, the different uh, Mythics is, is much larger than even the kind of like the jumps between some of the Torment levels. And so it's one of those ones where, and your your gear, um, you know, doesn't scale anywhere near as quickly uh, when you're going through and getting into some of those ones, as well as just kind of like having like gear caps, as in you know you can't really Titan forge an item beyond this item level. This is your theoretical maximum that you could go and reach. Um, good luck, you know, at, at that point. And then at that, you're just uh, pushing yourself to see how high that you can get. Um, but a lot of that is just done for the ability to say that you did it. You know, if you have, well, your loot caps out, you know, at Torment 13, or like your loot experience and all other such caps out at Greater Rift 85, and everything else that you do above that is just for the sake of saying that you can do it above that, you know, most people at that point are just going to spend their time playing Greater Rift 85 for the, the efficiency sake of it, but then that also increases the diversity with what you can go and, you know, play. What what builds are actually viable at Greater Rift 85 for doing, you know, speed runs, kind of like your, your what would be your quote-unquote rat runs and such. And, you know, with this most recent patch, some of those things are definitely going to go through and change as they're trying to build all, the, they're trying to bring all of those sets closer together. There still will be a meta, and because of the power creep, you know, those kind of uh, idling, uh, you know, greater rift like 100s, 105s, 110s with rat runs might switch over to a different build at 112s, 113s. You know, uh, we're, we're not exactly sure yet, but it's, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Like, like you said, there's always going to be a meta. There's always going to be a least, a, a, a lesser efficient way of playing. But I think to sum up my long-winded uh, comments on this, to the actual um, uh, what you see for the actual level of difference or what the, what your, um, dang it, how do I word this? Sorry. Um, kind of like what the, what the perceived level of difference between them is is going to be a lot smaller and so you won't feel as penalized by playing a non-meta build if you know say like that that upper limit was greater rift 85 well you know i can i can clear 80s you know with with my particular build so it's not that's not that bad as opposed to saying well i can clear an 80 with this build whereas this other one can go and clear a 110 that that looks a lot you know rougher when you have a, a much greater uh, scale of difficulty with that ever increasing, um, you know, greater rift system, that makes those differences look, uh, you know, from what they are. You know, you know, going back to like Diablo 2, you know, going in, you know, clearing hell, you know, between like say a, a double a double dream, a bear sork, and like a, a fishy mancer, you know, might not be all that much you might be able to like clear all of hell you know like in a day or a couple of hours if you're going for like a 100 completion as opposed to then going and hopping on like a, a an enigma hammered in and then you can clear it in like no time flat because you're just teleporting and one-shotting everything so it's um you know it is it's definitely what what i think it's more the whole meta versus casual is based more so on per perception with the sheer number of greater rifts in between with Diablo 3 system. And I feel it's something that they could address in the next Diablo by uh, compacting it, having a smaller number of greater rifts 
but having a much more significant jump in difficulty between them. Because uh, if you if you can clear, say, you know, Torment 12 versus clearing Torment 13, it doesn't feel as bad, you know, as opposed to having 30 levels between you. Uh, it's definitely, for me, is it's a per, it's more so perception than anything else. I hope hope that a I answered the question somewhere, like within those last 30 minutes I was talking about, because this is one of those things that I've thought about a lot. Um, not necessarily from like the the, the meta versus um, non-meta type builds, but it, it's it's something that I thought about the how how much kind of like perception. Um, in the skewed difficulty system uh, goes uh, you know in Diablo 3 versus uh, Diablo 2 so we'll we'll see from there but uh, that does go through and bring us to the end of our uh, community feedback if you have uh, any emails uh, the comments questions for the show uh, epic loot or items that you want to um, send off or if you have any comments on like what you would like to see on the show going forward um, please drop me an email westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com um, Riker I'll definitely be hitting you up if you're still there in the stream um, you can also go through and uh, find us me cry on uh, twitter at the WM workshop. Uh, and of course, we will still continue to be live streaming here every other Wednesday night at twitch.tv slash blizzpro at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, go ahead. If you follow us uh, on Twitter, uh, you'll be able to go through and see when we go live. Uh, you can also, uh, you know, check out. We don't have a lot of other content from blizzpro that's going on on the channel at the moment. Uh, but any, uh, any follows or subscription uh, support on uh, the Twitch channel does go to supporting the BlizzPro network as a whole. Uh, so not only supporting, of course, Diablo.BlizzPro.com, where this show, um, you know, is home and originated from, uh, it will support all the rest of the the, uh, the BlizzPro network, um, as well as some of our other non-live shows, such as uh, Well Met. Um, you can also, you know, continue to find uh, all the content that we hear about on the show and more at Diablo.BlizzPro.com. You can also find us in-game. We are the BlizzPro clan. Uh, if you don't want to leave your current clan, you can always hop on and join us at the uh, in-game community. Just do a search for Westmarch Workshop. You can also find us on Discord. We're at Discord.gg slash BlizzPro. Um, I normally try to be on there as much as I can. These past couple of weeks, work has been crazy, and so I've not had the opportunity to be on there as much. Uh, but hopefully um, things will be freeing up a little bit more, and I'll be hopping back on there. Though uh, you'll probably, if you find me on there in one of the Diablo channels uh, starting this Friday, I'm going to be on there. I'm going to be playing Diablo 2. Maybe I'll see you in there, and maybe I'll, you can join me with uh, some Diablo 2 ladder action. That'll be fun. Uh, but you can also follow me at Nineball Gamer on Twitter and at twitch.tv slash Nineball. Um, scheduling permitting, maybe stream some D2 here uh, over the weekend. We will uh, go through and check that out. And of course, you know, we want to, we still want to go through and wish him uh, the, the best and all that positive energy. You can still go through and follow Leviathan at Leviathan D3 and at twitch.tv slash leviathan111 as he goes through and gets, you know, real life and all that other stuff uh, sorted out. So go through and, you know, send him send him some love, send him some uh, positive wishes and such uh, while we wait for his inevitable return back here at the show. But thank you all for joining us on tonight's episode of the Westmarch Workshop, and we will look forward to seeing you guys in a couple weeks.